Go with me to the book of Colossians, if you would. We're, we're starting a new sermon series today. We're doing a deep dive in the book of Colossians, and the timing couldn't be more perfect because our focus, our focus as a church, as individual followers of Jesus, needs to be this. Jesus is greater than Whatever else might be coming my way, there was a song back in the day, bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my fears. Jesus is greater than whatever else might be coming your way from the hand of the enemy. I'm convinced, I'm convinced that if there could be a settled sense in your heart, Jesus is the answer. Now tell me again the question. If you can have a settled sense of that, you'd be in pretty good shape to face whatever's coming your way. So a couple of big ideas that I want to invite you into as we spend this time together. And then when we come to the end, I want to bring you back to these ideas and see kind of where you rate, you know, put it on a scale of one to five, put it on a scale of one to 10. Where are you with Jesus first? Now, I know that can be a tough one. I know that can be a tough one because there are a lot of things that compete for your attention. There are a lot of things that compete for your anxiety. There are a lot of things that compete for your fears. What if, what if you could have a settled sense of Jesus, you are greater than whatever else comes my way. Jesus first. I want to invite you into this thought process. What if you could develop a Jesus lens, Jesus goggles, right? To look at the world through. What if you could see, what if you could see your spouse through the Jesus lens? What if you could see the people in your life, the people you love, the people you care about, the people, honestly, that you're so afraid for because you see how one wrong move, one wrong decision could just create a cascade of challenges that may be really hard to come back from. What if you could see people in situations and circumstances through the Jesus lens, when, when your wife is getting on your nerves, not that mine would, but yours might. Even more challenging. Ladies, could you possibly see your husband through the Jesus lens? This one's much harder, right? Especially if, like some friends of mine, your number one prayer is that, oh, that my husband would fall in love with Jesus. Or your number one prayer was, oh, that my teenage son would fall deeply in love, genuinely in love with Jesus. Oh, oh, that my parents, oh, that the people that I love the most would fall deeply and genuinely in love with Jesus. And there could be a a prayer in your heart that would say, Lord, in Jesus' name, may I see whatever comes through the Jesus lens and how you were at work in the lives of the people that I care so deeply about so that even the bad things, the hard things, the things that I would never choose, I could say, Lord, what are you trying to say to me through this? What are you trying to say to this person that I love through this? Not that you would deliver me from, but that you would speak to me through. Amen? Whatever it is, that God has sovereignly allowed into my life, what if you could develop a Jesus lens for all that? You remember how Jesus said at one time when he said, come to me, all you who are thirsty, and I will cause from your inmost being springs of river to well up and flow out. Springs of living water. What if there could be a springing up of the gospel in your life? Where are you at with that? When, when, you get, when you get squeezed, right? When you get squeezed, what is it that comes out? Is it gospel or is it grump? I want us to look in Colossians because there's some things that I just think are so, so good in Colossians. And over the next several weeks, we're going to spend some time and we're going to hit these. For instance, there's one that talks about the supremacy of Jesus, 
right? The, the preeminence of Christ. There's a line in Colossians chapter 1. It talks about he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. But the way I memorized it when I was a kid, that in everything he might have preeminence, that in everything it might be Jesus first. Jesus first, and everything else falls into place. Jesus said at one time, well, in one place, he said, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things are going to sort themselves out. All these things are going to take care of themselves. All these things will be added to you. What if Jesus could have that place of supremacy? We're going to talk more about that. In Paul's day, every religion... Every religion had its own set of secrets, had its own mystery. And for your introductory offer, if you will pay the fee and join my club, I'll tell you my mystery. I'll tell you my secret. You'll get the decoder ring. You'll have it all. Every religion had that. Paul comes along and he says, it's not about religions. It's not about their secrets. There's a secret to Christianity, but it's free For the asking and the secret, the secret, Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles this glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I was talking to a new friend earlier today, and he was talking about how, how do you know, how do you know which religion actually has got a corner on the market of truth? How do you sort through it? And isn't it arrogant to think that maybe we've got something that the others don't? How do you wrestle through all that? I said, well, you know, we're going to be talking about that today in Colossians because there's a divine spark that God has put in all of us created in the image of God, with eternity set in our hearts. And the secret, the mystery, is when people like you and me come to a place in our own awareness of God that we say, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you let that spark that you've placed in me become a flame that burns from the inside out and changes me for all the world to see. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. And the new has come. There's your mystery. There's your secret. We're going to unpack that and unfold that as we go further in Colossians. There's another one. It says, it says this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, uh, things of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's one of my favorite places to go to when the team is leading us in worship. Lord, in Jesus' name, I want to set my heart on things above. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you free my mind from all of the other distractions so that even if it's just for this short period of time, Lord, that I could live, I could have a mind unfettered by all the cares of this world and I could fix my heart on you, I could fix my mind on you, I could fix my eyes on you. There's this place where it talks about Jesus being at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and me. And maybe one of the things that Jesus is asking the Father, is Lord, in Jesus' name, would you capture his attention? Would you allow him to set his heart, to set his mind on us? Well, I want us to spend some time working through all of those things and more in Colossians. But I want to start chapter 1, verse 1. And just begin there. It's interesting. Colossians it doesn't get the same kind of airtime that Galatians gets or, or Ephesians gets or even Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, four of Paul's general epistles to the churches. There's a reason why Colossians comes last in that equation. I made a joke earlier that you remember the order by General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians. And somebody said, no, 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 it's not that. It's go eat popcorn. I'm like, Whatever. 
Whatever. There's a reason why Colossians comes last. It's actually the least of those cities. The least of those churches. It wasn't a, an important trading post. It wasn't an important uh, economic or political place. In fact, in fact, if you were to do a tour, if you were to take one of those guided uh, tours of, you know, the, the, the lands of the New Testament, you would find the ruins of Ephesus and you would find the ruins of Galatia, but you would never, you wouldn't find anything that would tell you where Colossae once was. It was the least of the places. And, and, and one of the reasons I think that might be important to you is some of you may be asking yourself, do I even matter? Does my life matter? Does my life count? When my life is done, will anybody ever even remember that I was here? I don't matter much. In fact, there, there was a friend of mine. He was, he was an army intelligence guy. I'll let you decide whether that's a misnomer or not. But he said, really, when it comes to security, your only hope is that you just don't matter much. Maybe you've been wrestling with whether or not your life matters. Maybe you've been wondering out loud, does my life make a difference? Paul wrote this letter to the least of those churches about the greatest message of all. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your mind on Jesus. Fix your heart on Jesus and everything else will fall into place. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Paul has a prayer and a promise for these folks at Colossae, even though he has never met them yet. He's never been to Colossae. He's been to Galatia. He's been to Ephesus, he's been to Philippi, but he's never been to Colossae. And he writes these people, not because he knows them, but because he's heard about them. And having heard about them, God began to plant something in Paul's heart that that took root. And every time those people in that place came to mind, Paul prayed for them. Every time. I think one of the greatest things you could do is to let somebody know that even when you're not in front of me, you're on my mind. I love it. When, when I'm scrolling down through, doom scrolling through Facebook, I love it. When I see something you've posted, something that brings you joy, something that burdens your heart, some, some piece of grief, some piece of need, some piece of rejoicing, and I can say, you know what? I know him. I'm going to pray for him. I know her. I'm rejoicing with her. I'm aware of that problem that she's facing, that he's facing. And I'm bearing the burden along with. Every time, every time, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we've heard about what God is at work to do in you. We've heard about it. Don't you love that? The idea that that God would call you to mind. And that when God calls you to mind, somebody would pray. Oh, man. If only there could be that Jesus lens, right? So that the people you love, even the people that make you crazy, if you could see them through the Jesus lens, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. I've got it circled in my Bible. When we pray. Not if we pray for you, but when we pray for you. We always thank God the Father when we pray for you. He goes on. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. It's foundational. 
It's the, it's the ground of our being. It's the thing that pulls us together. We may come from different places. We may come from different experiences. We may have different race, ethnicity, uh, economic background. There may be a hundred things that divide us, but the thing that unites us, the thing that pulls us together is our faith in Jesus. And by the way, if you haven't come to that understanding yet about who Jesus is and the supremacy of Jesus, in just a few minutes... I'm going to ask you to. I'm going to ask you to I'm going to ask you to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. In fact, there's going to be an opportunity whether whether you want to pray with Jason or with Jack or with me or someone else to have a prayer that would go something like this, Jesus. I need you. I see that now. I see that now. He says, "Look, we have heard we've heard about your faith in Jesus Christ." In fact, that's the number one thing we know about you. Not your occupation, not your past experiences, not the points of your failure, but the number one thing we know about you, the difference maker that we know about you is your faith in Christ Jesus. And, he says, your love for all God's people. It's all about Jesus. And by the way, it's all about people. Do you remember, you remember when they came to Jesus and they said, can you tell us, would you tell us, please, the first and greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength. It's all about Jesus. It's all about your relationship with the Father. It's all, it's all about restoring the brokenness. It's all about coming to the place where you know that you know that you belong to the one who set eternity in your hearts. It's all about God, it's all about your relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus gave him a twofer, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it. In fact, the second one is inseparable from it. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. We've built an awful lot of what we do and how and why we do it around here among the, upon the idea of for our neighbors. The people could walk in this place and we could say, you know what? This place isn't for us. This place is for you. This place is to reach you with the most important news that could ever be shared with you. In fact, a pastor friend of mine, my friend Andy, he says, he says we've built an entire outreach plan on the idea that you can fill in the blank with a statement like this. I'm going through blank and that's really hard and we just want to help. People who walk into our church on any given Sunday and say, I just moved to town and I really don't know anyone. Oh, well, just moving to a new town and not knowing anyone, that can be really hard. We just want to help. So come to Mops and meet a few other people who are kind of in the same season of life and cycle of life that you are. Or maybe you're new to, to this area and you're trying to start in a new school. Come to our student ministry where you can find some other people who, who just want to follow Jesus. And, and maybe you can find some chemistry and maybe you can find a place to belong. Because starting school in a new place can be hard and we just want to help. Or maybe somebody is grieving a loss. And man, there's nothing more lonely than that. And somebody comes along and says, you know what? There's this lady in our church who's just one of the most loving, kind people you'll ever want to meet. And there's this deal, we call it grief share. And, and um, nobody, nobody chooses it, but having had grief thrust upon you, you just need some other people who could walk that same journey with you. Grief is really hard. And we just want to help, right? Paul says, look, we have heard about your faith in Jesus and your love for all God's people. And every time we think about that, every time we hear about that, we pray. And every time we pray, we thank God for you. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you allow it to, if you allow it to, it will spring up from within you. He says, he says we've heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, the faith and hope, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel. 
What if it could be an animating feature of your life? Not just, not just a, a box that you checked on the form for eternity, but an animating feature of your life, something that springs up from inside of you. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about yet another self-help program. I mean, in our day, in our time, there, there are a hundred competing gospels out there, right? I'm talking about the true message of the gospel. I was talking to a friend. He said, you know, how do you, how do you know? How do you know who's got the true gospel? Who's got the true message? Because you've got one. Some other church has another. There's, this one looks different. This one's more formal. This one's more informal. How do you know who's got the true message? I want to just, can I give it to you? Can I just boil it down? Because Jesus said, you know what? You need to come like a little child. This isn't rocket science. Make it too hard and you've messed it up. Let me just read this to you because, because it's, it's foundational to you. It's where your hope springs from. In, in Romans chapter 3, maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've heard this before. It's just, it's just really just lays it out. It says, all have sinned. That's where the gospel starts. The gospel starts with the fact that we are lost without him. When a kid comes and says, I want to get baptized, we always ask this question. Do you know what sin is? Do you know what sin is? And almost always they'll say, yes, I do, because I have a younger brother. <laughs> do you know what sin is? Uh-huh. It's when you do something you know you shouldn't do. It's when you take something that doesn't belong to you. It's when you're not fair. It's when, it's when things go against you and it's just not right. I know, I know what sin is. And from a very early age, we get it. And then you ask the next question, have you ever sinned? And they say, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, then you're not ready for the gospel. But you know, don't you? You know of the times that you have done exactly what you wish you hadn't. When you said or done or gone to the place, mentally, physically, emotionally, that you knew was not where you belonged. If you don't know you've sinned, that's a whole different conversation that can wait until you do. But you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then just a few chapters later, it just lays it out and he says, look, the wages of sin, the natural result, the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death. It's separation from God. It's being cut off. It's, it's being left behind. It's, it's, it's a life that's not filled with living. It's a life that's marked by guilt and separation. And it doesn't just cut you off from God. That's the important part. But it also cuts you off from each other. When, when you've got sin that you have to hide, that you have to keep people at arm's length, because if they knew the truth about you, would they love you? Here's the beautiful thing about God. He knows the truth about you. And even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul says, look, this, this faith that you have in Jesus Christ, this love that you have for all God's people, it springs from a true understanding of the gospel. It's not rocket science, y'all. It's not. You don't have to get a degree from a seminary. You don't have to speak Greek and Hebrew to figure this out. I have sinned, Lord. I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I've tried, but I can't save myself. Jesus, come into my life. Not because I deserve it, not because I'm good enough. Come into my life because of who you are, not because of who I am. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, having heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for God's people that springs from the hope that you found in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And then he says this, in the same way, in the same way, this gospel is bearing fruit in the whole world. Same way it is in you. Same way it is in you. <laughs> have you noticed 
Have you noticed if you've been coming for a while, if you've been humbling yourself to become part of a, a, a small group or a fellowship or a Bible study group, or, or you've been coming and allowing the, the worship to wash over you, or, or you've, just been, you've just been sort of uh, just easing in. As you, as you bend the knee and bow the head before Jesus, God begins something in you. Have you noticed it? Have you noticed it? Have you noticed that, that the more you kind of press in, the more you're aware of God working on you, doing some things. There's this place in Scripture where it says, he who began this good work in you will perform it and perfect it and complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's at work in you. And by the way, he's not just at work in you. He's also at work in everybody that you look at through the Jesus lens. He's at work in everybody that you care so deeply about. You may not be able to see it yet, but he's at work. You may not be able to understand it yet, but he's using you in their life. And by the way, he's using them in your life too. He says, he says this message of the gospel is bearing fruit and it's growing throughout the whole world. This is God's plan. It's God's plan for us here. It's God's plan for each of us. It's God's plan for our families. It's God's plan. God's plan for our world. So let me invite you to sort of turn the searchlight on the inside of yourself. Where are you on the question of Jesus first? Jesus first. When when life gets hard, when you get shaken and squeezed, what is it that spills out of you? Is it your relationship with Jesus? Is that where you fall back to? Is that what squeezes out when life gets really hard? Is Jesus first or first among many? Are you in a place where you could pray a prayer that would say something like this, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, would you help me to fix my eyes on you and fix my mind on you and fix my heart on you? Could that be your prayer? How about this? Looking at life through the Jesus lens. That Lord, in Jesus' name, I could trust you enough to take whatever comes my way in this life. Knowing that you love me. Knowing that you protect me. And that whatever you have allowed in my life, Lord, that somehow I don't get it, Lord. But somehow you want to change me and shape me into the image of your dear son. Or how about this one? Lord, that in Jesus' name, what would spring up in my life, what would water the dry soil of my life, what would spring up is you. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I told you I was going to invite you into the gospel. Have you come to that place where you've recognized and acknowledged, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I can't do it myself. I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not consistent enough. I try. And no matter how hard I try, it feels like I'm trying to build a house of cards. Jesus, I need you. Jason would pray with you. Jack would. I would. There are others who would love to pray with you to simply come to that place. It's not rocket science of saying, God, I get it. I get it. I don't know everything there is to know about you, but I know some things about me. I need you. I need you. Come into my life.
No, precious ones. That's the difference maker. That's the foundational piece of who you are. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, precious ones, the greatest gift that you could give to the people that you love is to let them know that you know Jesus. Today's your day. And if you were to pray a prayer like that today, you could get baptized. You could begin a new life. You could do, you could do the things that move you forward in your relationship with Jesus. Would you stand with me for a minute? Just in a spirit of prayer. Lord, you know me. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. And somehow you love me anyway. I don't understand. But Lord, in Jesus' name, would you come into my life? Lord, in Jesus' name, would you take your rightful place on the throne of my life? Lord, for what it's worth, I give you me. Precious ones, a prayer like that from your heart to God's ear is the difference maker. It's the thing, it's the thing that you can point to that says, this is where I stand. This is the defining piece of my life.